Thank you very much for your kind words of presentation. Thank you to Republic TV for this uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in Mumbai. Since the 80s, I've been visiting India and I've been what, witnessing the great progress of this country. I've asked to speak about globalization just as a way to introduce our next panel. Let me just start by saying that I believe this process of globalization is different from others we had in the past because of its scope, because of its depth, because of its speed. To a large extent, it's driven not by political will or by policy making, but because of developments in science and specific, specifically in technology. So I really believe that process of globalization is here to stay, even if it's true that we see strong resistance. Another important point to note is that this process of globalization is happening at a time of profound geopolitical changes because it comes after the end of the so-called Cold War. The, ch the change in dynamics between some of the most important global powers, the spectacular rise of China, and also new trade tensions that, in fact, are probably linked with some of these geopolitical tensions, including the increasing competition for technology. Technology that in many areas has, in fact, dual use, not only technology for civilian purposes, but also technology for security and defense matters. I continue to be a believer in globalization. I know about its shortcomings. I know that the impact it can have and certainly has had in some cases in our political systems. But I believe that thanks to globalization, it was possible to lift hundreds of millions out of poverty. And its globalization from a civilization point of view is also a way of putting people in contact to the rest of the world, namely to higher levels of literacy, to knowledge, to science, to the cap capacity that is given for people to fulfill its dreams. But it is also true that in some countries, including in Europe, including in the so-called West, but not only in Europe and in the West, globalization is now feeding populism, nativism, protectionism, and sometimes nationalism, what I call negative nationalism, because in fact there is nationalism that we can understand and support, the nationalism for self-determination, the nationalism of countries that are new countries that want to assert themselves, but I don't agree with some of the expressions of today's nasty, ugly nationalism that tries to raise national identities against others, and it tries to replace the good sense of hospitality by the negative sense of hostility. I continue to think that for our countries to have success, they should commit to openness. Indeed, I don't know any country that has been successful uh, in the global scene without more economic openness from a trade and investment um, point of view. Now, we see resistance to globalization because there is movement. If there was no movement, we will not see this level of resistance. But if we ask ourselves, if you make this exercise, of course, it's always a risk to predict the future, but if you ask ourselves, how will the world be, let's say, 10, 15, 20, or 50 years from now? Are we going to see more or less trade? Are we going to see more or less cross-border investment? Are we going to see more or less international exchanges in science, in technology, also in culture? Are we going to see more or less international communication? Are we going to see more or less international travel? I really believe that the trend will be for more exchanges in trade, investment, and in people-to-people -people contacts. So what we are watching today in the world is a very important fight or struggle between the forces of openness and those that want to close the world between those who believe in the flux, flux not only of goods, capital, 
services, but also the flux of ideas and friction, friction against that flux. Friction or flux will go into win. I continue to think flux will be stronger. And in fact, we have seen this and I've seen that during my 10 years leading the European Commission and the European Union. In the financial crisis, it was an unprecedented financial crisis when many people were predicting not only the collapse of the euro, but even the collapse of the European Union. And we saw the capacity of the European Union and the resilience to open. In fact, we took the initiative together with the United States to call for the G20 at heads of state level because we understood perfectly well that the G7 or G8 was no longer able to respond to those challenges, a group where there were countries not like China or like India or like other very important economies, we needed to have a new framework, institutional framework, to deal with completely new challenges. And in fact, we have done basically well. But now we are seeing new tensions, and those tensions are extremely important. What I can tell you very briefly to conclude is that in Europe, we are looking with great attention to India. I believe this country has indeed a greater future. You are in purchasing power parity, one of the most important countries in the world, together with China, United States, and the European Union. You are the fastest growing economy, large economy, with annual growth rates around 7%. In 2017, the European Union was the first trade partner of India. I know that sometimes in India there is not that perception because usually people see it in terms of country by country, but as a partner, as a trade partner, we should consider the European Union as an entity. And the European Union was the first trade partner of India and the first source of foreign direct investment. India is the ninth party of the European Union in trade terms. So you see the potential there. There is a strong potential to develop in this relationship. So we are looking at great interest for, to India, not only because it's a democracy, the biggest democracy in the world, but because of the very important geopolitical position that India occupies here in this very complex region. We see India as a promoter of stability in this region. And we also believe that we can do many, many things together. One thing for me is clear. In this world, complex and predictable as it is, to face challenges like protectionism, like international jihad terrorism, like, of course, financial instability, like climate change and many other factors, we cannot do it alone. In Europe, our countries, they cannot do it alone. We need to be together. We, can, we are no longer in a situation where we can say, your side of the boat is sinking. We need to do it together. And we believe that with India, we share something that is very important, is our commitment to a multilateral order, rules-based, where the United Nations and WTO should be at the center. That's why we continue to believe, and I say, facing the recent improvements that we have seen in India, we continue to believe that there is a great future for the relationship between Europe and India, and we very much welcome all developments for, as it is your topic of today, for the search of India. Let's work together for that to happen. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>